are the fact that we tend to rely on our natural understanding to deal with those things. And so we react very much like everybody else. And uh, that's not really what God wants us to do. You know, the great call that God has placed on our life, and it is a great call, is to walk with Him. You know, when Jesus was calling the disciples, He said, come follow me. And it's really about walking with God from the beginning of time. You know, it talks about Enoch, and Enoch walked with God and was not, because God took him. He was the friend of God. In the beginning, in the garden, it was about walking with God in the cool of the day. And so the call of God is really to walk with God. And as we walk with Him, He knows what needs to change in us. And He knows how we can be best used by Him to accomplish His will and purposes. You know, so often in my own understanding, I have great ideas about what I could do. And I find more often than not, those great ideas uh, really don't accomplish much. But as I do what he wants us to do. You see, the danger is that we, we begin to think about doing the right thing as being the right thing as the world sees it. And that isn't always the right thing. You know, the Bible talks about confronting one another. The Bible talks about speaking up. The Bible talks about loving one another. The Bible talks about uh, how Jesus came not to bring peace on the earth, but to bring a sword. And so there is a time of division coming, which isn't necessarily a bad thing if it's division between believing and non-believing, or um, false believing and true believing. In Matthew chapter 26, uh, that's where I'm reading from today, and it says, Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment, and she poured it on his head as he sat at meat. I, I, I'm sure it was quite the spectacle. You know, there's Jesus at this guy's house and they're eating and everything. This woman comes in with this uh, costly ointment or this valuable, precious ointment and she begins to pour it on Jesus. She begins to pour it on Jesus. And, and there's not so much a reaction from Jesus as there is a reaction from everybody else. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation. They had indignation. I, you know, you got to wonder what the indignation was, and I, and I guess that's the same with us. Sometimes when something happens in the kingdom of God, we get filled with indignation. Part of that is we get filled with indignation that we hadn't responded to God to do that ourselves. You know, we had sort of, oh, well, it's no big deal and everything. And so when someone goes out into the world and they live for God and they start reaching the lost and they start manifesting his greatness and they start uh, demonstrating true love that God has for people. And sometimes we get indignant about it because, well, because we wish we had been obedient and done it first. That's the first thing. And so it said, when the disciples saw it, they had indignation saying, to what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. You know, we always can can mask our indignation with some kind of a righteous perspective, right? Um, well, that guy or that girl or that person's out there ministering to a certain group of people. Well, I, you know, that uh, <clears throat> that's not for me. Or that isn't very spiritual. And sometimes we talk about it and we say, you know what? They really don't have a very good understanding of God. But they're, they're doing it. You know, it's interesting. Jesus said, when he was dealing with this situation with the woman at the well, he said, my meat is to do the will of him who sent us. So the maturity in the kingdom of God, the, the meat eaters as opposed to the bread or vegetable eaters, the meat is to do the will, not just talk about the will. It's interesting so how often we talk about evangelism or outreach or uh, programs or whatever. But how often do we actually get around to doing the things that God's told us to do? And when Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble you this woman? For she hath done a good work unto me. For you have the poor always with you, but me you have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. And verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also what this woman hath done be told for a memorial.
Now it's interesting that um, there was really more to the story because if we read a similar account in John, in John chapter 1 we have a similar account and it says then, John 12 and 1, then Jesus six days before the Passover came to Bethany where Lazarus was which had been dead and whom he had raised from the dead. Pretty spectacular stuff. There they made him a supper and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. And then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of this ointment. Can you imagine that? The sweet smelling savor. And then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? You always got to like that religious uh, voice that speaks out when God's doing something and uh, kind of like a cold water were thrown on the fire. And this he said, not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. And Jesus said, Let her alone against the day of my bearing, hath she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but me you have not always. And much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but also that they might see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, and because of that, by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. And so that's what's happening. In, in our world today, in our world, in Jesus' day, all down through time, there have been these great moments where God is doing something. And we're either with what God is doing, or we're opposed to what God is doing. And sometimes we're opposed thinking we're doing the right thing, and that's where it gets dangerous. It's, it's one thing to be hot or cold. It's another thing to be lukewarm, which is to be against something for the wrong reasons. The Bible says in the last days that people will deliver us up to be killed, thinking they're doing God's business, God's will. Today, I think we live in a time where it's so easy to, to look righteous without being righteous. To do what we think will make everybody think we're spiritual or we're good or we're holy or we're righteous or we're doing the right thing. That's the easy, anybody can do that. But there's a real danger in that. One is that, that we begin to love the praise of men more than the praise of God. And because of that, then we continue to do that. And it's subtle. It comes in subtly. You know, we stand up to give a testimony in a service and we say, it becomes subtle. It's a subtle thing. We stand up in a service to, to give a testimony and the testimony begins to be more about what we're doing than what God is doing, or who God is, or what God has done. And yes, it's, it's great to share testimony about what God is doing, but when we begin to become the center of that, when we begin to be the focus of that, you know, it, we can say, oh, I just want to invite all of you to come out into the streets next week, because every week you know I go out and witness to the lost down on the whatever street. And you know what? That, that sounds righteous, but in a sense it's not really righteous because you're really just uh, exalting the fact about how you're going out onto the street to reach the lost. In Mark 8, 27, it says that Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi, and by the way he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Who do men say that I am? You have that encounter all the time if you're talking about God at all or if it comes up in a conversation. People have all kinds of weird ideas about who Jesus was. Some people have a good idea of who Jesus was. And they answered, some think John the Baptist and some think you're Elias and others one of the prophets. And he said unto them, but whom say you that I am? 
most of the people that know you probably know you go to some church gathering, some religious gathering somewhere or something, and so they know you believe something. And so, but have you ever articulated what it is you really believe? Not in a preaching way, but just because it's so part of your life that it just oozes out of you just like everything else that's part of your life. That's like that ointment. It just, when the name of Jesus comes up, it just oozes out of our life. And he said unto them, But whom say you that I am? And Peter answered and said unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. See, if we were there, we would say, oh, no, Jesus. No, you don't have to die. You're, you're a holy man. You're, you're doing great things. God is pleased with your life. You're healing the sick and raising the dead. You're, you're ministering to the poor. You're doing great things. And so Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. And when he had turned about and looked on his disciple, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan. You see, Peter was looking at it from the natural standpoint of what seems to be good stuff, righteous stuff, holy stuff. And I'm not saying that other stuff wasn't good and everything, but Jesus had come for a purpose that was greater than that. That all might come to know the Father. Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savoreth not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. We all love comfort. We all love to be loved. We all love to be part of something. We all want to be liked. But we have to be careful that we don't allow that desire to become greater than our desire to live for God. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's what we're called. That's the walk. Walking with God. Taking up our cross every day, getting up in the morning and saying, I'm with you, God. I'm with you. I'm follow." On, I'll follow on. Show me, correct me, change me, shape me, rebuke me, correct me, lead me, build me up, encourage me. All that stuff is part of walking with God. You know, some people, we were talking about resisting sin and struggling against natural tendencies. And well, some people said, I get so tired of Resisting, I get so tired of fighting against those, those things. And I said, you know what? Uh, I, I, I too, I'm there. I, I get tired of it sometimes. But I recognize that as long as we're resisting, we're still on the right path. As long as we're resisting sin. As long as the struggle is still real in us, we're on the right track. It's when we stop struggling that we have the problem. When we stop struggling is when we have the problem. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Think about that. What profit is there in that? In, uh, as we're reading in Scripture, there's so many things that Jesus teaches us, but it's in Matthew chapter 6 we have this, we've talked about it lots of times, but a very important thing. And he warns us about doing things to be seen of men. 
Matthew 6 and 1, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them, otherwise you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. And it comes in subtly, it comes in subtly, it comes in subtly that, you know, that uh, whether it's the offering plate or whether it's us talking about ministering to the poor or, or giving money to, or money to people or giving food to the food bank, when we start to talk about what we're doing that way, it's great to say, you know what, God's been leading me and God and I have some great walks together and God is doing some amazing thing and I'm glad to be part of that. That's one thing. But when we get into the whole thing about... I'm doing this and I'm doing that, and I know we I know we think sometimes that we're doing it to encourage others, but in reality we're doing it because deep inside we want the affirmation of man. Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them; otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Is that what you want? No reward from God. You know, it's hard living in this world, and it's great to know as we live in this world that we have the reward of God as we follow Him and are obedient to Him, and we do it silently without making anyone aware of it. Because you know why? Then we didn't receive anything back because someone saw us do it. We receive back because God blesses us. Isn't that great when God blesses us? When it comes directly from God. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. But verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when you doest thine alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thy alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. You know, I want to see a blessing come on the body of Christ. Not a fake one, not where we manipulated the internet and we've got this money or, or that kind of thing. But just because we've begun to put our, our belief that God is the one who's going to bless us. And if I'm diligent about the things he calls me to do, he's going to bless me. But when thou doest thine alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thy alms may be in secret. And thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. Isn't that great when we get rewarded openly and it's the blessing of God. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corner of the streets that they may be seen of men and verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when you pray, go into your closet and shut the door and pray to your Father in secret, and thy Father which sees in secret shall reward thee openly. That doesn't mean we never pray together as a group of people. It just means that our real passionate prayers, those intimate things with God, we, we, that's where the time is spent seeking the face of God, where we can bring up those very personal and private things that, that everybody doesn't need to know about. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they should be heard for their much speaking. Be you not therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have needed before you ask. And down in verse 16 he says, Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. You know, growing up in the church, growing up, I've seen sometimes where we sort of have this idea that poverty and piety and, and demonstrating that publicly is, is, a, is something we're supposed to do. And you know what? Acting poor or demonstrating you're poor in front of people is the same kind of thing. It's about getting the pity of man. Oh, that man has given his life for the gospel and has nothing. That's not God. That's the flesh. Yes, you can give everything, but don't look like you gave everything. Get dressed, comb your hair, wash your face. Do your best to live in this world in a way that people see you as someone who is real and alive and human. Because God sees in secret. God knows what you gave. God knows what you've given up. God knows what he's doing in your life. God is the one who will reward you openly. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We need to learn to 
be careful at the body of Christ that we're not jumping on bandwagons and being seen out in places uh, supporting things or giving things or praying or things that uh, all for the purpose of being seen of men. Wow, look at that guy. He's so busy in the kingdom. He must be someone special. You know what? All of that just takes away from the blessing of God. Do stuff. Be led of God. Minister into the lives of people. Give all the glory to God. That He might bless you. That He might move in you. That He might do amazing things in you. That's what we're hoping to accomplish, isn't it? That's what we want to do. That people might see this move of God among people who have no hierarchy, who have no status. They're just people together wanting to have God be present in their gatherings, having the will of God done in their communities. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what shall you eat, or what shall you drink, or now yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowl of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And, and why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. You know, we were out at the farm where I live now, and uh, we were watching, and then my wife went out in the yard and she saw this turtle beside the pond sitting on the grass, and she uh, picked it up because she thought, you know, somebody might, you know, hit it accidentally with a lawnmower or something, she was going to put it closer to the pond. And as she picked it up, she realized that it dug a hole and it was laying eggs. So she gently put it back down and um, the turtle sat there and it, I don't know, 10, 12, 14 eggs, you know, before it covered the hole and went back into the pond. And we, were, we were just thinking how amazing it is that God, as we walk in the woods, maybe someplace where no one has ever walked that we know of in a place, and there is this gorgeous mushroom or flower or fungus or thing that God in His design created, and it's so spectacular in its beauty, and yet no one may ever see it. God didn't put it there so that you could say, oh, look at how that, you know, look at that. Although that's a good thing. He put it there for his pleasure. He put it there for his pleasure. Whether you ever see it, whether you ever acknowledge it, whether any man or woman or person ever sees it, God put it there. The blades of grass and the lilies of the field and the all the little flowers, amazing thing. The weeds that, as they flower and grow up and the wild grapes and all the things that there are. And God did all that and he never was worried that he had to impress somebody with it. And that's what he's trying to teach in us is rejoice in God and what God's doing. Participate in what God's doing, but never seek to have to have approval for doing it. God's approval is sufficient. God's approval is sufficient. And for His pleasure, you are and were created. We are His workmanship, created for good works in Christ, the Bible says. How exciting is that? How exciting is that? Oh, there's so much more we could say. Let's pray. Father God, as we go through these times that we live in. We thank you for the opportunity we have to shine as a light, not to bring glory and honor to ourselves. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Father, we give you glory and we thank you for all that you're doing in and through us. We ask, oh God, that you correct us in the areas where we have gone off where we've allowed the acceptance of society or the praise of men or anything like that to become what we're seeking after. Yes, we know that you've called us to live as much as is possible peaceably with all men, but we know that everybody won't live peaceably with us. And so God, we just ask that you give us wisdom to know the difference. Give us wisdom to let your light shine through us. 
to minister into the lives of people for your benefit and for their benefit, that you might receive glory and honor and praise, that your kingdom might grow, that God, that amazing things might happen. So we ask, O oh God, that you continue to lead us by your Spirit. We commit our path and our life into your hands, and we know that we often have failed you. But we thank you that your word says that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Cleanse us, O oh God. Cleanse us, O oh God, from the things that we've done that are not pleasing you. Reveal them to us that we might ask your forgiveness. And Father God, we do truly pray for wisdom and boldness and compassion and all the things that we need to manifest in this world today as we live here, that the world might be turned to you, that they might look to you and say, God, I need you in my life. I need you in my life. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. i mm -hmm.